Good morning, everyone. I'm Peggy John, Communications Manager with BC Transplant, and it's my pleasure to chair this session today on non-adherence, uh, an opportunity for you to walk a mile in my shoes. Uh, we have two presenters today, and we're going to allow them both to speak before we take questions. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Fortin first, and then our guest speaker, uh, Yannick McDonald. So, Dr. Fortin comes to us from Montreal. She is a uh, transplant nephrologist with the hospital at the University of Montreal. Uh, she has a PhD in bioethics, and her interest is very much in ethical issues around transplantation. Uh, she's worked on a number of research grants from the Canadian Institute for Health Research and the Kidney Foundation of Canada, and she is a scholar uh, the, sorry, she's a scholar with the Fond de Recherche en Santé du Québec. And that's as good as my French gets. So um, we're very fortunate to have her here today. And uh, she's going to follow after Yannick McDonald. And uh, I just want to say it's my pleasure as communications manager to also oversee our volunteer program. And we have more than 230 volunteers around the province who help us to raise awareness. And when we worked on developing the program, we really felt that the experience of volunteering was as important as the work they do in helping us to raise awareness. Um, and our, our aim is that uh, this will continue to positively impact on their journey through life as a person and patient. So we first met Yannick uh, just over a year ago as he volunteered with us at Operation Popcorn, where we thank the people working in organ donation. And uh, as we got to know him, we were really struck by the power of his story and the incredible journey that he's been through in his uh, short, less than 30 years. And so um, I think it takes great courage for him to be here today and, and to share his story with you. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Yannick McDonald. Hello, everyone. Forgive me, my nerves are a little on edge. Um, my name's Yannick, and I'm going to share with you all uh, my sh uh, story and uh, to give you all a perspective on chronic kidney disease. Um, when I was eight years old, I was diagnosed with henoch shawn line purpura. Uh, it resulted in two kidney transplants, over 20 surgeries, cancer, uh, a decade of dialysis, and a lifetime of improper blood chemistry. In grade three, I was sick with uh, colds back to back for months. Uh, it, was, it was, wasn't ending. The doctors tried everything to make it stop. Until one day in grade three, my teacher, Ms. Seraldo, I walked up to her complaining that I couldn't move my right leg. Um, 24 hours later, my right leg's paralysis turned into full body paralysis, uh, acute spinal arthritis, I was told. I was uh, bruising from head to toe, and my organs were bleeding. Um, the doctors didn't really know how to treat HSP at the time, so they decided to throw chemotherapy, um, prednisone, and a whole whack of different antibiotics at me. Um, at the time, I didn't know how to take pills. I was only eight, right? So um, my mother used to have to crush up prednisone and chemotherapy, and she'd spoon feed me this powder, and the taste is putrid. It would make me vomit multiple times every time I'd have to take medications, and I'd force it down anyways. I'd try and try again until I got it down. By nine years old, HSP had run its course and left my kidneys with too much visceral damage for me to survive. Um, I was going to need dialysis one day. When I was 11, I started dialysis at the Children's Hospital here in Vancouver. And uh, at the time, my mother, she, uh, she was a single mom. Um, she had to work at Liquidation World. so. Uh, I would have to take a handy dart to and from dialysis alone at 11 years old. On average, it would be about a seven or eight hour day for to do dialysis. Um, it only took me six months to find a kidney transplant at that age. I guess it's because of like they need it for kids need it to grow or something like that. But um, I was pretty lucky to get one so fast. Unfortunately, though, um, at this time, medicines, uh, the surgeries for kidney transplants, the rate of success was 50-50. And uh, I was quite, like, right on the line. It took um, 11 operations to get the kidney working. Um, yeah, the, the ureter was shot. It, it was starved for blood. Um, 
the ureter didn't connect properly and uh, it was leaking urine all through my body. My peritoneal cavity would fill up with urine. My legs were swollen with urine. I remember my left leg just being all puffed out with pee and you know, it was gross to think about, but I put it out of my mind. Um, they ended up putting um, six different tubes all through my body to drain residual urine. And uh, I, my mom would strap them to my legs, my thighs, my belly. It would just be, you know, i just wear baggy clothes. It was whatever, right? So in order to fix this problem, they had to cut up my bladder. They, uh, they took it and they sort of did this with it over my broken ureter and um, then they glued it together. Apparently, I was told that I was the first person that human glue was used on internally. Hospitals can be really tolling on you. You're stuck in bed for long periods of time. Multiple different pieces sticking out of you bother you a lot. And um, after so many months of enduring this, I'd stop eating or being a kid, really, at that age. And uh, the doctors wanted to put a feeding tube in me to keep me alive. But um, my mother saw me being tortured day in, day in and day out. She decided to discharge me and take me camping. She made me eat again when we went camping. And uh, we stopped in at hospitals all around Vancouver Island, you know, just to make sure my condition was stable. And eventually we went back to the children's. I was readmitted. And uh, I was poked and prodded for a little while longer until they discharged me. After the hospital, I went back to school, grade seven. I still had all of the tubes hanging out of my body and taped all around my legs. Navigating hallways full of kids, um, you know, they just bounce off you like crazy. It's, it's quite nerve wracking. You, you walk around like this because you never know what kind of elbow is going to catch that tube, right? So I was quite scared. But my mother brought me up to be normal no matter what. Through chemo, I was outside playing with kids, doing water fights. When I went to school, I, if, I, if I had tubes, I'd have to go to school. My mother told me one day when I complained that I was feeling really ill, that if I don't see blood, you're going to school. <laughs> As a teenager, I was very rebellious, mouthy and a pain in the ass. I loved to be with my friends all day and night. My mother would have to hound me to take my pills. She'd call my friends, hunt me down, anything, just make sure I took those meds. I hated the pills. Prednisone, whenever it glanced my tongue on swelling, it would taste just like the powder when I was a kid. It was horrible. I'm not sure I remember the whole picture of what I endured in children's or, you know, all the experiences, but. Uh, I just didn't seem to take my pills seriously. Grade 10 was a shining year of failure for me. My highest grade that year was 43%. That year I started smoking pot and drinking with my friends. I just wanted to be normal and do the stuff my friends did. I didn't really see myself as a sick kid. You know, I mean, I tried. I went to meetings with other kids who had chronic illnesses and I just felt out of place. You know, I just wanted to be normal. So. I, I did my best, but fitting in was hard for me because I, people that age don't really know what it's like to fight for your life, so I would always keep my history to myself. The few times I elaborated on it with my friends or a room, it would silence them. It would humble everybody, and I hate that. I hate feeling like this humbling presence, but so I just kept it all to myself. One day, I went to see my father who lived in Montreal. He, uh, he didn't really know much about my condition, and uh, that made my mother tremendously worried about my medications. I was convinced it wasn't a problem. While in Montreal, I got sick with a flu. Within one week, I missed 70% of my transplant medications. When I returned to Vancouver, I was puffy and stopped urinating. I did enough di uh, damage to do chronic rejection. It was only a matter of time. I was 16 when they told me I was going to have to start dialysis again. It, it shattered my life, you know, knowing that I was going to be attached to a machine again. I actually prayed for the first time in my life that night. I was so desperate. It had caused me to really hate what I did. When the transplant society, a lady named Sharon Duncan, asked me if I wanted another transplant, I told her I wasn't ready. You know, it was, uh, it was horrible what I did. 
I felt that I needed to serve a sentence on dialysis to teach me a lesson, as what I did. But uh, unfortunately, that sentence on dialysis didn't really teach me how to cope with my pills. When I started dialysis, I happened to be in a unique situation. My pediatric nephrologist was retiring, and rather than give me a new pediatric nephrologist, they decided to graduate me to an adult early. Soon enough, I was 16 years old doing dialysis side by side with senior citizens. In my second year of dialysis, I had an old man crash right beside me on dialysis. A team of people flood, flooded in and jumped on top of this man, giving him CPR to keep him alive. Hemodialysis can be very draining, literally and figuratively. I used to take up, six, up to six liters of fluid off in four hours. I can only describe that feeling as somebody grabbing your spinal cord at the base and tugging it down until your head hurts. You can't walk. The days of dialysis, I was puffy, short of breath, and eager to take off my fluid. The days after dialysis, I reserved for bouncing back. I had no kidney function at all. I did not pee a drop for 10 years. It's unreal to think about that now. When you need dialysis, your body can't filter out many things. For some patients, like the dietitians mentioned, potassium is a very huge issue. I was told it'll uh, turn your heart to jello and you cannot be revived. They, they tried many fear tactics on me. Didn't work. But for some reason, my body handled potassium very well. I don't know why. My, my problem, though, was phosphates. My phosphates climbed so high. You're supposed to take these phosphate binders with every meal, a handful of calcium and a handful of phosphate binders, every meal. Tedious and just the worst. When your phosphates climb that high, you get insanely itchy. It feels like something is trying to secrete through your skin, and you just can't scratch it off. I would scratch to the point of bleeding. Once, I was so itchy I was going insane. I decided to draw myself a bath. Hopefully, I could wash this stuff off. Have any of you ever felt itchy underwater? It's crazy. So even through all this torture, um, I couldn't find it in myself to take these, anti these uh, phosphate binders. I don't know why, but um, my phosphates were sky high my entire 10 years of dialysis. Um, a few years later, I decided to, uh, oh, my apologies. Um, I eventually developed hyperparathyroidism. They, uh, they had to cut out my parathyroid gland. Typically, they replace a, a one piece of it and put it back, but it didn't take. I no longer have a parathyroid hormone. So uh, another body part lost due to my irresponsibilities. A few years later, I decided to try peritoneal dialysis. I'd like to take a moment to thank the PD department. Um, they are by far the warmest, nicest people I've ever been treated by. Thank you very much. But when they put in a peritoneal tube, it's traumatic. The doctor takes this huge shish kebab and climbs up onto the table. He puts it underneath your belly button and uses his body weight to shove that thing through you. I remember the feeling of that shish kebab hitting the bottom of my back when it went through. It's a horrible feeling. With PD, they put all this sugary saline inside of your peritoneal cavity. It grows from 2.5 liters to 4.5 liters within just a few hours, depending on how much fluid you have on board. With this much fluid inside of your peritoneal cavity, you're always short of breath, no matter what. I would have to exhale and hold my breath just to tie my shoes. Luckily though, PD is a very good form of dialysis. I wouldn't have to worry about phosphate binders, fluid intake, all of that. All I'd have to worry about is being clean. I wasn't able to do that either. Unfortunately though, my life had more hurdles in store for me. I was getting recurring peritoneal infections. Tremendously painful. It feels like something's burning your insides. But through, th through some sort of freak luck with all these infections, a CT scan on my abdomen revealed a tumor on my native kidney. I had cancer. Three weeks later, I was diagnosed with it. Unfortunately, soon after, my father was diagnosed with cancer as well. I survived that year. After all this stuff passed, I went back to hemodialysis. My peritoneal cavity needed some healing from all the damage I had done to it. 
Once back on hemo, I was offered the opportunity to do home hemodialysis. I jumped at the chance to get out of the hospital. Training took a few months. The hardest part was learning how to stick these huge needles the size of a prong on a fork inside of your fistula. I would struggle for 15 minutes to stab myself at times. Eventually, I got the hang of it. The scariest moment I've had on dialysis at home was when the power failed. These machines have a 30-minute backup battery built in, which they anticipate this, but the sump pump does not. Imagine two to three bathtubs of water gushing out of the wall while you're on dialysis alone. Well, my apologies, my girlfriend was there. <laughs> Traumatic, but if I can take myself off dialysis mid-flood and clean it up with needles hanging from my fistula, I think I'm doing all right. After nine years of dialysis, I found out about the Parrot Exchange program. My mother volunteered, and within eight months, I found a new kidney. The days leading up to my freedom were nerve-wracking. I had seen so many others get kidneys before me, but now is my turn. I hope so much for it to work out. I met with my surgeon, Dr. Guan. I expressed a lot of worry and anxiety. I asked about his statistics on his kidney transplant successes. But he won my confidence with a simple Schwarzenegger quote. I'm an easy sell if you know me. Soon enough, I was finally transplanted. I remember they, after they took out my catheter, I had to pee for the first time in 10 years. I was so excited, my first steps towards the toilet were so surreal. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I completely missed the toilet. It just <laughs> went everywhere. <laughs> Nowadays, though, I'm doing really good. <laughs> I graduated from BCIT for land surveying, and I work for a reputable firm, engineering firm on very big and small engineering projects. I take a lot better care of myself, and I've learned to be pretty decent with my medications. I'm very thankful for a third chance at life, and I intend on making the most of it. Thank you very much. The bar is really high to talk after this testimonial. I will look very boring, I'm sorry. So, well, I, first of all, I would like the uh, to thank the organizer of uh, BC Kidney Days for inviting me to speak here today. So you have listened to the presentation from the expert. I'm not the expert, I think Yannick is the, the expert in the story of non-adherence. So, well, I will try to present you some facts about non-adherence and related ethical issues, so it will be really more boring. So, <laughs> And I should mention that some of my slides are courtesy of my colleague, Beckett Foster, a pediatric transplant nephrologist who is um, it's in her research field, with whom I presented to the last CSN meeting. So... <coughs> What do adherence and compliance mean? Well, we often use the term compli uh, compliance, and it, it's funny because in French, we mostly use this term rather than adherence. And compli uh, compliance refers to the extent to which an individual's behavior coincides with medical advice. However, compliance involves a hierarchy between the healthcare professional and the patients, which is why the preferred term is adherence, which implies a more active collaboration between the patient and healthcare professional. In the late 90s, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain proposed the term concordance in order to describe a relationship between equal partners in a, partners in a therapeutic alliance. Although this term is interesting, it is not widely used. In this presentation, I will use adherence and non-adherence. <clears throat> 
Even though I present to, to you some definition, in reality, the concept of adherence is ill-defined, leading to a variety of patient behaviors, and we, we have had some illustration with the Yannick testimonial. For instance, some patients might take a drug holiday or practice white coat adherence, which means starting to take their pill regularly just before their blood tests or medical appointments, so they look okay. There are also uncertainties around how to measure non-adherence. Do you use a pharmacy refill records, self-reporting, blood levels, or electronic pill bottles? All of these measures are inaccurate and have their drawbacks. Given the lack of clarity around adherence, it is not always clear whether non-adherence is the main factor behind acute rejection. Most of the time we suspect this, but patients do not always disclose their non-adherence to us. And we have, when it comes to non-adherence, we need to assess the responsibilities of the patients versus those of healthcare professionals. In this slide, I want to remind every, uh, everyone that we ask a lot uh, of our patients. Following their transplant, they have to take 10 drugs per day on average. Also, some immunosuppressive drugs need to be taken at specific times of the day in connection with meals. And, well, apparently some of them are not palatable. So, and most of, here, uh, of us here today do not take that much medication every day. In addition to their medication, transplant patients have a lot of medical visits and lab tests that could interfere with their job and social life. Many of our patients also have lipid problems, diabetes. We ask them to modify their diet, exercise in order to not become overweight. Well, I have to confess, if I was a patient, I wouldn't be a model one. So, and uh, probably most of us here wouldn't be. Well, on this slide, my colleague Beth Foster reports all the risk factors in the literature associated with non-adherence. Well, these factors could be related to the patients, well, the age, um, socioeconomic status and everything, to their social environment, if they have social support or not, their drug regimen, and healthcare teams. Is pre-transplant non-adherence a predicting factor for post-transplant adherence? Well, it seems yes. These two studies have shown that pre-transplant non-adherence increased the risk of post-transplant non-adherence, but it increased the risk. It's not a certainty. This table summarizes the consequences of either delaying or proceeding to organ transplantation with a non-adherent patient. As we all know, there is a greater risk of mortality with dialysis than with the kidney transplantations. Patients' quality of life is also poorer during dialysis than following kidney transplant. In the case of children and young adults, hemodialysis could interfere with normal physical and personal development. Finally, in regions where there is a pediatric priority in kidney allocation, well, we have this in Quebec. I don't know if here you have this, but we have to consider that if we delay waitlisting until after their 18th birthday, the waiting time for a kidney will be much longer. On the other hand, if we transplant a non-adherent patient, there is an increased risk of graft rejection, graft failure, and sensitization, which will make it harder to find a match for a second transplantation. Also, a rejected graft is a wasted organ, which is unacceptable in the context of organ shortages. How do healthcare professionals feel about non-adherent patients? In a recent study, Mellor and colleagues interviewed nurses working in a pediatric dialysis unit in the UK in order to understand their perceptions and management of non-adherence. Nurses reported negative reaction in cases of non-adherence, such as frustration towards patients and or their parents. They used negative words to describe non-adherent behavior, such as cheating and dishonesty. At the same time, they acknowledged that life with end-stage renal disease was difficult for adolescents. The nurse's response to non-adherence was guided by the principle of working the best interest of the adolescents. In order to adhere to this principle, they described using persuasion and few said use coercive methods 
such as telling patients off, physical restraint, and even hospitalization. In the following slides, we'll take a closer look at different ethical issues related to non-adherence. One important principle in our Western bioethics is patient autonomy. This means respecting and honoring wishes, values, and preference. However, this principle does not mean we have to do everything the patient wants. It should be balanced with other principles. In other words, physicians are under no obligation to transplant a patient who is unable to adhere to his treatment. Healthcare professionals also have ethical duties and autonomy. On the one hand, they want to act in their patient's best interest and would therefore opt to transplant them since it's the best treatment, treatment for end-stage renal disease. On the other hand, they do not want to cause harm. If they transplant a patient who does not adhere to his treatment, the patient will lose the graft and so on. We are currently facing an organ shortage. Organs are scarce and a precious resource of which we are stewards. The two principles involved in organ allocation are equity and utility. Utility dictates that we allocate an organ to a recipient for whom it will be the most beneficial. Allocating a kidney to a patient is, who is not adherent and who will lose the graft rounds counter this principle. What do healthcare professionals think about adherence and organ transplantation? Well, Alison Tong and her colleague have performed a systematic review of all studies published about healthcare professionals' perspective on organ allocation. Not surprisingly, adherence was considered either as an absolute or relative contraindication to kidney transplant. This being said, the respondents also mentioned that the concept of adherence is ill-defined. Another study reported patients' perspective on organ allocation. Focus groups were conducted with Australian patients on dialysis and kidney transplant recipients. Among the 23 criteria identified for organ allocation, lifestyle factors, including adherence, rank 12. For participants in this study, patients who lost their graft because of non-adherence should have lower priority in the allocation process. Some participants even claimed that it was morally wrong to allocate organs to non-adherent patients or those showing self-destructive behavior. During the qualitative interview, the theme of deservingness, which included adherence, frequently came up. For participants to allow non-adherent patients to have access to kidney transplantation is unfair for adherent patients. Well, it's funny to see how the public or the patients are more severe than we are when we judge uh, patients. And recently in transplantation, a paper was published reporting the results of a web-based survey administered to Australians about their preference regarding the allocation of donor organs for transplantation. Various clinical scenarios were presented in which adherence was one of the factors. Respondents indicated that non-adherence would decrease a patient's chances of receiving a kidney. However, the worst case of non-adherence described was missing a tablet once a week, and this was not related to any rejection episode. Is it possible to success successfully retransplant non-adherent patients? Well, we it seems to be yes, <laughs> but uh, according to the transplant team from Minnesota who published their finding the AGT in 2009, it seemed also to be yes. In their cohort, they identified patients who had lost their graft be, uh, because of overt non-adherence. These patients had to go through a rigorous medical and psychosocial assessment. Well, you have the details here. And if they... Uh, successfully completed this assessment and proved that they were adherent in dialysis, they were relisted and retransplanted. 35 formerly non-adherent patients were retransplanted. Among these patients, 57% had repeated non-adherent behavior. The risk of being non-adherent increased with the presence of, one, uh, of more than one risk factors. But this being said, only five patients over 35 lost their second graph because of non-adherence. This table showed the detail of each patient. Three of these patients were first transplanted in their early 20s, and the main reasons for non-adherence were financial issues, 
depression and chemical dependence. Well, what conclusions can we draw from this study? It depends if we are optimistic or pessimistic. Well, if you are pessimistic, well, we could say that a non-adherent patient will remain remain non-adherent, but if you are optimistic as I am, well, we could say it could be safe to retransplant non-adherent patients following a rigorous selection process and expect satisfactory graft survival. I want to talk here about the capabilities approach and I think it's a, inter an interesting theory of justice when we talk about non-adherence. In recent years, the capabilities approach has been used in bioethics to look at different questions involving justice and welfare. This approach focuses on developing what patients are able to be and do. The first person who developed this approach was Amartya Sen, an economist and philosopher from India who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. He was interested in social justice. And, well, he wanted to... Uh, to uh, classify country in another way than um, just GDP. So uh, he developed the capabilities approach, which is the evaluation of a person's ability to achieve various valuable functionings as a part of living. So functioning, what is it? Well, it refers to simple needs such as food and shelter, but also to more complex needs such as being respecting, having self-esteem, and so on. Individuals should have freedom to choose between different functionings. So freedom is very important. So an individual who has some financial difficulties and who's not taking his medication is not in the same situation as someone who can afford, has social support, and who does not take his medication. So we, the approach toward these two individuals should be different since they do not have the same capabilities. Sen did not address the issue of health in his theory, but Martha Nussbaum, who is a, an American philosopher, developed this approach further. She sees capabilities as opportunities to, for individuals to do what they are able to do and become what they are able to be. A good society is one that provides these opportunities to its citizens. In her book, Creating Capabilities, she described 10 basic capabilities such as life, health, and bodily integrity. These capabilities are shaped by social re relationship and the environment. The capabilities approach, I think, could alter our views on non-adherence since it obliges us to understand our patients' capabilities and to look at how they want to develop them in order to attain goals that we have mutually agreed upon. How can we use the capability approach to increase adherence? I have no definitive answer. One way to look at this would be through patient engagement. Well, I know it's a buzzword right now, but I think, well, it has some merits. By further engaging patients in their health, we could offer them opportunities to do what they want to do. Patients are partners in their care, and this approach acknowledges that patients also have an expertise. Well, they know what it is to live with a disease. And finally, this is also a way to empower patients and help them to self-manage their disease. Finally, patient engagement also involves taking into account their family, social, and economic environments, which also influence adherence. How can we engage our patients? Well, first of all, we have to listen to them. I do not know everything, and I do not know what it is to live with a kidney transplant. To lose my hair for, uh, because of tachyonomies, and for a woman, that's not a good thing. To gain weight and have stretch marks, so I don't know what is it. In recent years, the concept of shared decision-making has emerged. It's the opposite of the doctor's knows best, and it is also the opposite of a certain view of informed consent where the doctor is a neutral provider of information and the patient is a rational person who could take good decision for him. So shared decision-making involves a dialogue with patients and healthcare professionals and take into account their preference and personal situations. Both patients and professionals work together to find the most appropriate therapeutic options. Well, this is the opposite of a one-size-fits-all approach. 
Also, if we want to engage patients, we, we must make sure that they are sufficient health literate in order uh, where they are, that they have the ability to read, to understand, and to act on health information. If our patients do not understand how their medication work and why it is important, we cannot expect them to be adherent. In order to increase our patients' health literacy, different types of educational programs and also decision aids should be offered. Well, I think with young adults who has a high phone grafted in their hands, probably we have to look at you know, formats that are familiar and attractive to them, etc. The concept of self-management refers to the task that the patient must carry out in order to live with their kidney transplantation and their ability to manage related medical, social, and emotional issues. This table is from a recent, a recent paper published in AGKD, reporting the results of a systematic review of qualitative studies in the field of self-management in kidney transplantation. According to the authors, we should promote autonomy and self-efficacy, provide clear recommendation, address anxiety about transplant rejection, minimize treatment fatigue, and support decision making in order to support the self-management of kidney transplant patients. Other strategies have been proposed, some of which are controversial. Well, certain authors have proposed a behavioral contract for immunosuppressant adherence. In a study by Shislam Burns and colleagues, kidney recipients signed a contract with their pharmacists. The patients met regularly with their pharmacists to discuss the, uh, their adherence to treatment, as well as different concerns and strategies to increase adherence. The study showed an increase in adherence measured by pharmacy refill records in the contract group compared to a control group. Well, we don't know in the, in the paper, they did not detail the contract, and maybe it's only the effect of meeting someone regularly to talk about our concerns and our medication. So, but the issue of contract, I think, is really uh, problematic. We are not in a business relationship with our patient, and what happens if the patient uh, does not meet the condition of the contract? We cannot say bye-bye. We, uh, we are no more in a relationship. So, well, I think it's really controversial. Another controversial strategy is offering financial incentives to adherent patients. According to the proponents of this approach, financial incentives could increase patients' motivation to adhere to their treatments and could save money by reducing graft loss. Well, there is no study who experience, we don't have any data on this proposal. And for these authors, savings realized could be invested in patient care. However, on what basis do you provide a fin financial incentive given that there are no perfect ways to measure adherence? Finally, what we mostly do, we postpone waitlisting until patients have shown some degree of adherence to their treatment in dialysis or medical visit, and we involve also multidisciplinary care. But it's funny that, you know, it's our attitude, but we don't have good data to support this, uh, the way of doing. So, in conclusion, further research is really needed in the field of adherence and organ transplantations for all age groups. Well, there's no one-size-fits-all solution for this complex problem, uh, problem, and probably we have to be creative because since there is no one-size-fits-all solution, probably we cannot answer this question with a randomized controlled trial. Probably we have to look at personalized and individualized uh, strategy to try to improve or uh, improve this problem. And patient engagement and self-management could be strategies to increase patients' capabilities and functionings in order to improve their adherence to treatment. So I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to apologize for my English, and I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, have a few minutes now for questions, and I've asked both uh, Yannick and Dr. Fartan to be up here. So um, I think that uh, certainly... Uh, Dr. Gill has a question, but I think the notion that uh, Dr. Fatan was talking about it is that also in non-adherence, what we've been talking about all, all the last conference is about really making things patient-centered, and I think that really applies here too. Dr. Gill? 
I just want to thank you both for uh, a great overview on this. I think the, you know, one of the biggest challenges that personally we have, I think, from a pre-transplant perspective is trying to make that decision about, you know, do we go forward with another transplant in someone who has a very clear and, and, and potentially, especially when it's a destructive history of non-adherence. Um, but I think, you know, I agree with all of the comments and you've highlighted nicely, Marie Chantel, where the, the field is going, which is, a culture shift. Um, so it's, it's moving away from a blame-based culture to one where acknowledging that there's legitimate challenges that need to be overcome. And so I think the, the difficulty is trying to get that uh, culture shift embedded in, in the broader kind of psyche of, of everyone taking care of these patients because, you know, it's very easy to say, even in some of the studies that have been presented to date, it, the, the carrot has been, and then we'll transplant you. Whereas in my opinion anyways, the shift needs to be, well, the goal is that yes, we will transplant you, but we need to figure out a way to enhance the success of that transplant. And so the goal of the intervention that we're doing before is not so much to decide if we should or we shouldn't, but should be to see how can we optimize your post-transplant success. And just your thoughts, Marie Chantel, do you think, like, is there work in terms of serving us, in terms of the health professionals, in terms of how do we change that culture shift? No, I haven't seen anything. Well, you see, the work uh, that has been done, it's in Australia, so, yeah. but that would be great too. Good, uh, good idea for a further study. Yeah, there you go, so. we can work on it. Yeah. <laughs> great, thanks. And we have a question over here. Yes, thank you very much. That was very uh, enlightening as an adult nephrologist, and I, I think these uh, issues tend to go through sort of that adolescence into adults. But just a question about, and I'd be interested in Nick's thoughts on, what would have made a difference in, in reflection and some of the things that are proposed now through the Kidney Foundation and other uh, opportunities out there are the whole role of coaching, you know, an independent coach sort of outside of the uh, healthcare system that could be touching base, isn't judging, and then peer support, just uh, where you felt that peer support uh, should fit within this of one young person talking to another young person and influences that way. Um. So you're basically trying to ask me like how I, uh, my opinion on how you could improve non-adherence. Um, okay, well, I couldn't really say for sure. I mean, um, like obviously communication and, in, and um, being sincere with your patient, especially if they're young. Um, for me, um, I, I elaborated a lot on this in preparation for this, prepar uh, for this presentation and uh, I feel that my source of uh, non-adherence was perhaps denial. I strive to be normal, and uh, illness is something I like to ignore, and medications are a reminder of that, especially when they come in bulk formats. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, improving communication, sincerity, and just trying to see it from a patient's perspective. touched on it a little bit here, but talking about justice and that we're stewards of something bigger. So as we're doing this, the more focus toward patient-centered and then trying to give them as much information as we can that we think they're capable of handling and then allowing them or helping them to come to their own decision and then doing what it is they say, even if we think it's probably not in their best interest, it really conflicts with that idea of justice that because we're not giving them the information that there's a bigger picture, right? If we choose to do your CPR, like you say, we can't afford to get a Clismap. Or <laughs> and the same with transplant. If we, we know this is what you want and you think this is going to be better for you, but we also know that there is also other people in your circumstance and we don't give them that information too because they couldn't handle it. Half the time I can't handle it. And, and they're in that situation. So it's really hard, I think, to give them a fair picture of what choice they're making when you're only looking at them, but truthfully as a community, we have to look at the whole picture. And I think this swing is getting really stressful, right? To do everything patient-centered, even when we know as professionals it's, it's gonna be a problem financially for everything else, or being patient-centered and, and having that swing to the point where people are making choices that aren't in their best interest, but we're letting them because it's more patient-centered. And when you're having these conversations in your community, where is that coming in? Because like, I, I get 
totally being patient-centered. We try our very best, but more and more I'm seeing that, right? And it's hard. When your community's talking about it, are they, when is someone coming in to talk about the justice piece and the stewardship piece? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if I could answer, but I think, well, the patient-centered approach do not dictate to do every, well, we, we try to help our patient, but it's true that there's not enough organs for everyone, and we have to keep it in mind. I think, well, the way of thinking of patient-centered approach is really, as Jag has mentioned it, to find way to enhance the adherence of our patients and to make sure, but it's true, maybe, I think there will always be patients that we will deny transplantation because the even though all our patient approach, we won't, we won't succeed to uh, get them and it will, we won't be comfortable to uh, allocate an organ. So. But I think the patient-centered approach leads us to think more globally of our patients and to take more his situation and to have a different approach and to blame and, you know, as Chiti, as the nurses. And I think, well, the nurse in the study I presented were really honest to, uh, you know, to disclose their negative reactions. And we must confess sometimes we feel like that when we have some patients who are non-adherent and we are trying to do our best, but we feel we have negative reactions. And I think it's, well, patient-centered approach will help us to have a more positive attitude and to look at what we can do for this patient. And sometimes it won't work, so, and we won't transplant them. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask Yannick, uh, did the uh, shish kebab uh, work? <laughs> Hello, Dr. Chen, pleasure to see you again. <laughs> Um, yeah, it worked. It worked great. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I think that's uh, it for questions today. Then I just again would like to, um, if you could join me in thanking both Yannick and Dr. Fartan and a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.